Again, Mark here from Talking Bass. So I was going to just perform a quick breakdown of the main riff from Battery by Metallica because I've had so many requests for a Cliff Burton bass line. And this is a song that I hinted at in my breakdown of Slayer's Raining Blood. You can watch that lesson by following the link in the info below. But I do have to mention before I get started that when I did a little research into Cliff's playing for this lesson, I was amazed by some of the commentary that I found. There's an isolated track of Cliff's line taken from the song and so many of the comments are derogatory, ranging from accusations of him being a sloppy player to more specific technical details about how he doesn't play the gallop along with the guitar. Just for reference, the bass line sounds like this. Now, I'm obviously aware that taking YouTube comments and trolling seriously is a complete waste of time, but this does all bring up a bit of a point regarding the mythology of a guy like Cliff Burton. Just for the record, I love Cliff's playing, and he was a real hero of mine when I was getting started in the late 80s and early 90s, but I think all of the worship of past icons can ultimately lead to disappointment. At the end of the day, Cliff was just a guy that played bass in Metallica. He wasn't superhuman, and I think anyone looking for a, you know, a technical perfection in a heavy metal bass player should possibly rein in some of those expectations. That's not what the music is about. It's about the feel, the sound, and the attitude. This isn't jazz, you know, there's no requirement for playing, you know, wide-ranging Coltrane style lines. It's not classical music. And I dare say that most fans of Metallica would be totally disappointed if the players all had, you know, metronomically perfect timing and robot accurate technique. If that isolated bass track from Battery was what many of the naysayers see as great technique, the feel of the song would suffer and it just wouldn't have that aggressive punk edge that it undoubtedly has. As for what the bass line really is, I think it sounds fantastic. Awesome tone, great driving feel, and one thing that you have to bear in mind with these kind of isolated tracks is that you're hearing the bass played solo. You cannot judge the timing and feel of a bass line played alongside real instruments without those instruments being present. There's no point of reference, and this goes for any bass player that you hear in isolation. Timing and groove in a band is organic and based on the overall group feel. Tempo can move around, musicians can play around the beat, and when you hear this away from the group setting, it makes no sense. Groove is not about rigid metronomic timing, it's actually the opposite, and when you factor aggression and attitude into the equation, things are never going to be perfect. Perfection is pretty much the antithesis of attitude. So, that brings me to the bass line itself. Today, we'll look at the main opening and verse riff for the song, and hopefully, you'll understand a little better why Cliff played the line that he did. So, here's the bass line along with a drum track. The tab and track can be found over at Talking Bass, so just follow the link in the info below. And while you're down there, just drop me a comment telling me what other Cliff Burton bass lines I should break down. I know Orion's always a popular one, as is For Whom the Bell Tolls and Anesthesia, but which line would you like to see? Just let me know in the comments. So first of all, let's just work through the notes. So we're pretty much in a kind of A minor kind of key, and um, we begin with this little lead-in of with these off, uh, offbeat eighth notes. So we begin on a B flat, sixth fret of the E string, and then into the A at the fifth fret of the E string. So, okay, so just little offbeat eighth notes there. We start on the first eighth note and then they're all offbeat. So that's the first line leading in. Then we're down onto the open E. So the next part sounds like this. Okay, so we're down on the open E string. Then B flat to the A again, so sixth fret to the fifth fret of the E string. Okay, so we've got two notes on the B flat and then leading into one on the A. Okay, and then we're back down to the open E, so. 
repeat the same thing again on the E. So then we have G, F sharp to the G, which is third fret to the second fret on the E string, two on the G, one on the F sharp, and then back to the G. Okay, and that G becomes the first note of the next bar. So. Then back up to the B flat to the A, so sixth fret, fifth fret on the E string. So. Okay, the next section sounds like this. Okay, so we've got open E there, open E string, then F sharp to the G again, second fret to third fret, so back down to the open E and then up to the G, to the G sharp, third fret to the fourth fret, so. Okay, so add all that together. Next, we repeat all of that, but instead of the little lead up, we have a repeat of that opening, you know, the uh, the offbeat eighth notes. So let's add all of that together. Finally, we have this little lead up of E, G, and A. So open E string, third fret, and fifth fret on the E string, okay? But there's an octave in there. So we begin on the E, and we're gonna uh, play the octave of that E there at the seventh fret of the, uh, of the A string. So we have. So that's the first part. So we're just moving between this open E and this seventh fret of the A string. So. Okay, so low. High, low, high, high, low, high. <laughs> then we're down onto the G. Okay, so there's the third fret of the E string, and we use the open E string as a, almost a bit of a ghost note, so. Okay, so when you play the first of those, so we have two notes on the G, and then we have the open E, which we can then hammer on back to the E, because like I said, it's just a ghost note. It kind of comes and goes very, very quickly. So, so just use the hammer on for coming back to the G, just to give it more of a smoother feel. And then you can just pick the next one. Then when we get to the A, we have six uh, notes there. We have... Then the D sharp or E flat at the sixth fret of the A string leading into the octave there at the seventh fret. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, D sharp, E, and that brings us back round to the beginning. Okay, and we're back to the start. Okay, so just that ascent again, very slowly. So that's the whole of that riff. So let's just try that slowly. So two, three, four. So just practice that away from metronomes, away from drum tracks, just on your own, just getting it under your fingers, okay? So don't worry about the timing to begin with, and then just you can gradually build it up once it's there. So I've uh, provided some backing tracks that work up progressively from 160 all the way up to 195, which is the original tempo. So let's just try that with 160 beats per minute. Ok, 
Okay, and I've just uh, sequenced up that drum track to play it round and round. So once you've got it, you can just keep playing it, you know, through. Next, let's try that bass line at 180 beats per minute. And finally, let's try full speed at 195 beats per minute. So now let's have a look at why I think that Cliff's line for battery is so good. Now I talked about this in the Slayer video and the concept is the same. Anytime you hear these high speed gallops in the guitar, the temptation may be to double it. But when you do this, the overall feel can suffer. Now it doesn't have to, a guy like Alex Webster doubles a lot of these uh, kind of riffs, but they have a totally different feel. Cannibal Corpse and most other death metal bands are much more frenetic and spiky. It's much more you know, on edge. Bands like Metallica, Pantera, Megadeth and Anthrax have a much more groove orientated feel. The riffs are much smoother and have a more kind of rolling feel. Even a thrash band like Slayer can fall into this category and one of the main contributing factors is this kind of half-time bass feel. When you play a galloping bass line at high speed, there are a lot of repeated notes going by very quickly and the envelope of the bass sound has no time to sustain and release. It's all attack. This means that the bass becomes very percussive and I don't necessarily mean clanky, you know. I mean spiky. Now that might be what you're going for. You know, it's not a bad or wrong thing, but if you want a better bottom end and a rounder, more flowing drone-like bass line, it's better to limit the number of plucks in there. Now, if I play the battery riff as I would if I doubled the guitar, you'd get this kind of effect. Okay. Now I suppose, you know, that sounds okay, but notice how it's very busy and there's no time for the envelope of the bass sound to settle. It's all attack. Okay. But if we play battery as Cliff did, you get a completely different feel. Okay, so you've got more of that drone. So just comparison again. And now Cliff. Okay, so you can hear how, you know, the envelope settles a little bit, we get more of that sustain and we get more bottom end and you get more of that rolling feel. So you can see here that whether or not Cliff could play that guitar riff is irrelevant. Maybe he could, maybe he couldn't. That's not an indication of anything. You know, I can play it and <laughs> I'm a nobody. The point is that the line he plays is appropriate and correct for the song. And this is why I think that Cliff is a great bass player. It's not because he's a technically brilliant player. You know, a guy like Hadrian Faro is obviously, you know, light years ahead of pretty much any metal or rock players in terms of technical facility. Everybody knows that, but it's missing the point entirely. He was perfect for Metallica and gave those songs the groove, the feel and the X factor that made them such a great band. So like this video if it's helpful and subscribe to the channel for lessons every Friday on every aspect of bass playing. Also remember to leave a comment and let me know which Cliff Burton lines you'd like me to cover in future lessons. The tab and the tracks can be found over at Talking Bass, so just click on that link in the info below or the card up there. And while you're there, check out the lesson map where you'll find over 300 free bass lessons on every bass topic imaginable, all organised for ease of navigation. Okay, I'll see you next week.